It's the Abajay Podcast. Let's go. And the next guest on the podcast is a regular and a dear friend of mine, Michael Pretty Boy Zarafa. Mike, how are we, my brother? Good, brother. It's always good to be back. How's things? Bro, not too bad, man. Look, we've got a bit of a background since the last time you were on. Yeah, man. It's been uh, it's been crazy the last few uh, few days. But, I mean, what do you do, man? Everyone believes the media. And um, that's, a, that's a sad thing in this sport. A hundred percent, man. But you know what? As time has progressed and, you know, we all have accessibility to social media. We all have different types of platforms. You now get to tell your side of the story, Mike. So tell us, how's the last week been for you personally? And what struggles and adversity have you had to overcome in this week? Uh, look, you know, it's been pretty disappointing to know that I've brought so much to the sport um, to feel like, you know, I've done nothing. Um, you know, I've had a lot of, <clears throat> a lot of inboxes, a lot of messages, um, a lot of abusive comments. But, I mean, look, this is a sport. You've got to have tough skin. Um, you know, when someone's made an opinion about you, you can't change that no matter what. So, for me, I know the truth. You know, we, we've put out our side of the story. The story's out there, out there now. So, it's up to people to believe. You know, I'm a fighter. It's my livelihood. This is how I earn money. It just doesn't make sense why I'd walk away from a fight, um, you know, when I fought bigger guys better guys uh, in their backyards on better on, on, on worse terms. But, um, you know, it's, it's just a shame. It really is. So talk to us about your preparation, your leading up to the fight. You came to Sydney three times. He was asked to come to Melbourne once. He didn't want to come because of COVID. How did you and your team feel? And then when the same thing happened the other way, the whole world went into a frenzy. That's, that's what I mean. You know, I, I'm just the villain. I'm not very liked, obviously, in the boxing world. But, I mean... Uh, that's my job, you know, it's, 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 it's a business, you know, it's an entertainment business. And, you know, I've got to sell fights, you know, every main event or pay-per-view, I'm involved in it. You know, whether it's with Jeff Horn, Tim Zhu, you know, there's a new guy coming out of the woodworks now, Isaac Hardman, you know, but it's always me. And, um, again, you know, people are believing what's coming out on their side, but no one's really believing what I've got to say. And it is a shame because... Like I said, this is my job. I'm a full-time fighter. Um, That's how I live. That's how I make money. And, uh, you know, it was a big personal line. I've been chasing this fight for three years, invested time, money into this fight to what one week pull out, you know, prior to the fight. So you know, people need to understand that there's, there's more to it. So talk to us about the intricacies of the whole process, right? How is it working with No Limit, with the Rose Boys, with Fox, a main event? You had to put in a lot of work. You came to Sydney three times did multiple media things, you did a lot of video shooting. So talk to us how you practically are in, I'm quoting you, that you were carrying the promotion because they're telling you, Tim's not doing anything. Yeah, and that's, that's exactly right. And that's what people need to understand. You know, I, I'm the draw card. You know, as soon as the fight got cancelled, you know, they lost 80% of pay-per-view, the venue was empty. Um, you know, they, they basically used me to, to sell the fight um, and put bums on seats. And, and I'm okay with that because, you know, that's that's... Like I said, it's an entertainment business, and I'm good at that. You know, I feel like I was born to be in front of the big, on the big stage, in front of the cameras. Um, but yeah, like I said, I was in Sydney um, three or four times, press conferences. You know, uh, why would I do all that to then not fight and, and you know say all these things and do all this stuff and, and go through a 12 week training camp of absolute hell to pull out? You know, and, and this is what people need to understand: it just doesn't make sense. And the reason why it doesn't make sense is because there was more to what actually happened, and there was two sides. And, you know, my side's out there now. And like I said, someone's got an opinion about, yeah, you can't change that. Um, and like I said, as long as my side's out there, you, you can choose. <laughs> no, 100%, bro. So what, basically your team, you know, when you went to the negotiating table, said we want X, Y, Z, which was COVID exemptions. We wanted to make sure that my team was safe. We didn't have to quarantine. That was agreed upon before the fight. Now, what people, don't, un what people don't understand in boxing is if you guys have a stare down, everyone's looking to see who pulls back first. So everything counts in a fight. Also, the promotion. So if you guys step down and said, oh, it's all right, we'll still come up, it's kind of a loss on your terms. Is that, am I right in saying that? 100%. And you know, prior to us signing the contract, we were in lockdown. You know, six weeks ago, Melbourne hit, got hit with another lockdown. And my team said financially, they just can't afford to be in another lo lockdown. You know, not me, my team. Um, you know, they got businesses, they got families to feed. And, you know, they were in a lockdown. They said, look, we, we, we physically can't. Um, afford to, to, to take the risk. So we need exemptions and permits. Team 
no limits, said, yep, no worries, we can deliver all that. Um, you know, promised the world and delivered nothing. You know, one week prior to the fight, we said, mate, we're still waiting on these exemptions, still waiting for these permits, um, just in case, you know, like obviously Sydney's red hot at the moment uh, and we can't, you know, afford to do that. And they said, oh, give us two hours. Within that two hours, they replaced me with somebody else. Um, you know, it wasn't me. I was happy to go there and, and do what I got to do. But, you know, I can't, they can't expect me to go there with no team. And they suggested for me to fly out on a, pro, on a private plane the morning of the fight and then after the fight, fly back the same day, which no one does that. You know, not especially, you know, I'm, I'm involved in the biggest fighting of Australian boxing, Zarafa Zoo. You know, it's not it's not an easy fight. You know, you want the right preparation, the right team, the right everything. They just wanted to wing it and throw me over there and, and pretty much throw me in the deep end. Not only that, the officials in the, in the contract were meant to be neutral. Uh, they said, oh, look, because of, you know, what's going on in, in the pandemic, they've all got to be from Newcastle. So I was basically going there with no team, no neutral judges or officials, uh, you know, fighting against my, with, by myself. And, you know, you can't do that in a fight this big. Look, 100%, man. And I want you to break down and tell the people, because not everyone's, in, like, in this close circle of boxing. Now, when Tim Ford in Townsville, the referee, he was training at his gym. Talk to us about the ties and the relationships and how important these judges and referees are and to have no biasness involved. I, like I said, it's all politics. Who someone's father is or, or you know, who someone's son is or whatnot, it's it's pretty bullshit, man. Like, it, you saw what happened, man, in, in the Jeff Horn fight. Um, you know, I beat him twice um, and obviously got stitched in that second fight. But, again, you know, you can't take nothing away from him. But, you know, the, I, I requested that I don't get that that same um, referee because, you know, obviously what he did to me last time. And, and like I said, yeah, that referee trains out of Tim Zhu's gym and, you know, has a good relationship with his family and it's pretty poor it's pretty poor but again it's out of my hands it's it's all politics now and, and my job's to fight but you know again in a fight this big you know I need my team there I need the right conditions they basically were going to pick me up and put me in the middle of nowhere um, by myself to fight and you know you can't you can't do that and then people that don't know that need to understand you know we said to Tim why don't you come to Melbourne then he's not going to come here without Glenn Jennings or Boris and his team you know what I mean we're, we're COVID free why didn't he come here he didn't even come here for a press conference. You know, and I was in front of his face three times. He had nothing to say to me but give me credit. And now all of a sudden the fight's off. He's found his balls and his vocals. And now he wants to do a bare knuckle fight in a car park. It's all, it's all, yeah. there's more to what, you know, people will see. Yeah, look, it's a crazy industry, man. Because look, I'm big on getting two sides of the story out, right? And your side hasn't really been told and for obvious reasons because they're pushing the agenda. Now you've told me that Tim didn't pull his weight in the promotion and, and no limit were coming and telling you you had to pull your weight. Once he pulled out, the first day, Tim Zhu was absolutely still respectful. He was actually shocked. And he, I'm not. I'm just calling it as it is. I'm not biased here. He said, Zarafa fought Kel Brooks in his home ground, you know, in his stadium, in enemy territory. He's not the type that'll pull out of the fight. He was actually confused and shocked. The interview's out there for anyone who wants to watch it. The next day, they've given him the script. And the poor bloke, look, he, I, he's not one that comes out as a shit talker. He doesn't know how to sell. It's not natural for him. That forced it on him. From his entrance to how he had to wrap up uh, his fellow No Limit uh, bloke, uh, Luke uh, Wilson. You know what I mean? They, they had to push. Liam, Wilson, Liam, 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 sorry, yeah. Liam. So they told him to push. And whoever knows Tim knows he doesn't give anyone credit. It's not his job to. You know what I mean? He's just a quiet assassin. But the promotion, the people got to him. And I feel that's what has the wedge in between is because the day after, he still wanted the Zarafa fight. It's still there, you know, and that's the thing. You know, people people still want to see it. And, you know, it's the biggest fight in Australian boxing. You know, I'm number one in my division. He's number one in his division. I'm number seven at WBA. He's ranked in, you know, the other sanctioned bodies. It's a huge fight. You know, I'm the former Commonwealth champion. He just won the Commonwealth title last night. Um, so we're... You know, I've been, he wants to be, you know what I mean? And he's doing great. But again, it's a fight that needs to happen. And um, I truly believe they did this to build uh, the pay-per-views, build the numbers and make it a much bigger fight. And they basically used me to, to to look like the bad guy and to be like the new Mundine Green. And unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, it's actually an honour to be the new Mundine and, and to be called that. So um, for me, like I said, I've got tough skin and, and I know the truth and, like I said, I've been there, I've done that, and, and like I said, it's it's just 
a shame to see how quick people can turn on you um, for, for the wrong reasons. Yeah, no, look, it's crazy, man. And especially when they're pushing the narrative. Now yourself, moving forward, right? What are we looking at? Are we looking at Isaac Hardman? Are we looking at getting in there again? Or is it in limbo at the moment? <laughs> yeah, look, I've got a big meeting um, with my team tomorrow. Um, and, and yeah, like I said, they're, they're working extremely hard. Um, and we want to bounce back, man. We want to bounce big, bigger and better and prove that we're not scared of Tim Zoo. That was never that was never a thought in my mind. Um, but we want to we want to fight the best. And um, but again, we want to fight the best when it's all you know even terms. You know, I, I agreed to go in his backyard on on his terms. You know what I mean? But the little things we asked for that we were promised uh, and and in, that were in the contract weren't delivered. And um, you know, all my team did was try to fight for those little things we requested, which they agreed on, and they didn't come to terms. So for me, um, you know, we never pulled out of the fight. We said we want the fight. We said, why don't we just postpone it till you know the virus clears, and then you know my whole team can get up there. There's no ifs, there's no buts, there's no flying Zarafa up the day of the fight, on him back by himself after the fight. You know what I mean? And, and people say, oh, you're a fighter, just go there and this and that. And perfect example, Liam, Liam Wilson. He was sitting there saying, you know, uh, and I think he's a great fighter, but you know, he was sitting there saying, you know, I miss my daughter's this, I miss my daughter's that for this fight. And but look at the outcome. Yeah, you know I mean, he got he, he got beat. He's got a loss now to his record, and that only affects him. You know, his team's by his side, but it only affects him. And that was because you know he thought his ego and not his brain, and that's that's a shame because he's a good fighter. But now he's just got a little dint in his his, his career now. Yeah, look, man, I I got a different theory to because I come from an MMA background. The O doesn't mean everything, you know. Floyd Mayweather absolutely changed the game, right? I feel with Liam yeah, Wilson, exactly. um, but it was a fight that he should have won. You know, it was a fight that he, he could have won and and probably should have won in his hometown and. You know, because he took it with, you know, a different mindset and, and this and that. And, you know, that, that fight, he fought quarantine for two weeks too. I look, you know 100%, I mean? so, man. And I'm probably so, the last to know, defend him. And for obvious reasons, the guy got stripped from the Australian title because he's an absolute rat bag. However, yeah. he's, he's pushed by <laughs> No Limit Boxing. No Limit Boxing are the Rose yeah. Boys. The Rose Boys are pushing him. He was going to be the next poster boy post him. If anything happened to Tim, if he goes overseas, Liam Wilson comes in and takes over the fold at no limit. And, and that's that what I mean. He rushed the fight. He rushed the fight. He didn't think with his head. His ego got in the way. And, you know, again, if it was a fight that, you know, wasn't at the caliber of me and Tim Zhu, I could have gone there. I've done it in, the, in other fights without my, my head trainer, but it was beyond my head trainer. You know, there was 15 other, 12 to 15 other team members that couldn't be there. Uh, you know, no, no support crew. You know, no strength and conditioning, pad holders, cut man. It was a, there was a, <clears throat> a range of people that couldn't come. Um, and again, I stuck by my team. My team stick by me, so I've got to stick by my team. But not only that, you know, they weren't planning to hub us to be safe and secure. Uh, and we, again, we never pulled out a fight. All we said was, um, you know, we want this and this, and that wasn't delivered. So which it was prior to signing the contract. Yeah. So from my understanding, contractually, they didn't oblige by it. And you guys never Correct. formally pulled out. You guys said, listen, you haven't pulled your side of the deal. What's going on? They go, listen, give us a couple of hours. They go call Stevie Spark, two divisions under, and said, this is what we're going to go with. Correct. I was at sparring when I, you know, I've got footage of me going live with another guy, um, Noonan Boy Promotions, and another boxing podcast. When I got told the information, I was at sparring. You know, I was in prep. I was a week out. I was my last sparring session. Um, and they said, yes, Rafa out, Spark's in. You know, and, and it's wrong because, you know, the truth isn't what people are, are hearing. And that's the saddest thing. You know, if I come out in media and said, look, you know, I'm having second thoughts and, yeah, sweet, say whatever you want to say. You know, you've got no heart, you've got no balls. But to say I bitched out of a fight um, because of what No Limits made me look like, it's just, it's disappointing. Um, and like I said, the only way now is to bounce back and to uh, fight bigger and better. And, um, you know, the thing about boxing you love, you can bounce back from anything. You know, a loss a setback, boxing, you just fight your way back to the top. And um, this hasn't done nothing to my career. People think, oh, Zaraf is over. It hasn't even started yet. Yeah, no, 100%, man. This this actually, if anything, elevates it, man. Like uh, Floyd Mayweather, he wrote the book. He said, any publicity is good publicity. You know, they're going to pay to watch you look at you, you look at all the fighters that are making money and making noise. You know, being the good guy, you know, you get nowhere. But being the bad guy, you get paid uh, and you make noise. You know, Conor McGregor, Floyd Mayweather, Anthony Mundine, you know, the list goes on. Um these guys are all turning millions and, and, and turning heads and putting bums on seats. And now when I fight, you know, everyone's going to, I'm obviously going to be the B side. Everyone's going to back whoever I'm fighting, you know, but again, I go out there, I beat them and I silence the critics. The best way is to, is to, 
is to win. 100%. And look, I was speaking to people from the boxing world and one of my close brothers, Slip, he was telling me that you could have went without a corner and some people have actually went and fought without corners in the amateurs. Now, the amateurs is totally different to the pros. But from what we've understood now, you didn't even have the option because they went somewhere else without actually telling you what's going on. Well, mate, they offered me to, they said, we'll give you a charter flight. And that was to fly up the Wednesday morning of the fight, fight, and then fly back straight after the fight the same day. So there was just so much confusion. There was so much, oh, let's just do this, do this, do this, and rush the raffle here and rush the raffle there, and don't worry about your team. And but who does that in, 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 at my level? Number seven in the world, number one in Australia. Who does that? Imagine ringing up Floyd Mayweather and saying, oh, mate, look, uh, just come over to Australia and leave your team there. But look, we'll fly you out on the day of the morning of the fight. And then after the fight, we'll fly you back. And uh, it's, it's, it's nonsense. Like, it just doesn't work like that. All, my, all, my, all we said was, mate, look, you said you were going to do A, B and C. You've delivered absolutely nothing. So, look, why don't we postpone it two weeks to the virus clears so my team and, and everyone else can and travel safely, COVID-free. And let's just, let's just get on. Postponements always happen in, in, in the fight game. You know what I mean? My, promo, my managers and promoters, uh, they do it all the time. My Mundine fight took 14 months because of the COVID. So all we're asking for was two weeks. It might have been done in a week. Who knows? We just said, mate, wait till it clears and we'll just do it then so we can go over there and have the best chance to win so it's on even terms. They didn't want to do that. So, again, that also answers that you did have a bit of health concerns early on in your fight, Pep. Uh, so you weren't actually underdone and you were looking for any excuse to extend it was they didn't come to the table you were ready to go you were a killer away my regardless i was ready to go i was ready to, like even when i was sick man we we worked on on our days off we didn't have any days off you know we we know we knew we missed a few days being ill and i was out of my hands but man i was ready on every sunday we we added sessions in to make up for the sessions we missed and we're adding extra sparring sessions i mean i was ready to go and the performance he put on last night and he's lucky i wasn't in front of him because you know i would have i would have shocked the world yet again and uh, again, people could say this and that, but you know, his time's coming. You know, he's calling out all these big names and this and that. He's never left, left his state. You know what I mean? I've been in there with the best, you know what I mean? And, and proven I can mix it with the best. I've done training camps at Wildcard and, and lived in America and was at, you know, with Freddie Roach and sparring all the big names. And I've, I mean, I've been around. And again, you know, like I said, a fight at this big, this caliber needs to be, you know, not last minute, you know, do this and do that. It needs to be prepped properly. Um, again, I was ready to go, man. I was, my last part was Wednesday. I was on weight. I was a kilo off. I lost seven and a half kilos. I was ready to go, man. Mentally, physically, was on. So we know what happened leading up to the fight. It was rushed. It was chaotic. They come and they call Stevie Spark. They leave you out of the blue. Now, talk to me when you were sick. Because i seen the reports came out straight away. Zarafa doesn't want to fight. Zarafa's out. He's not <laughs> answering his phone. They did the same thing to you. What people aren't seeing is that's the second time it's happened. In the span of what? That's what, what I mean, yeah. That's what I mean. This whole camp, you know, they did everything they can to make me look like the bad guy, man. And I just kept smiling. And I think that was that was what was getting to them because I'd always rock up and, and prove them wrong and, and, and just keep smiling. And, you know, I was I went to training, <clears throat> a normal session, and then halfway through the session, I said to my coach, you know, I'm not feeling the best. I feel a bit, you know, a little bit of pain, a little bit sick. And later that night, it just it hit me. Um, in the bathroom, I was obviously throwing up and just not feeling well. Um, and my trainer said, mate, look, let's go straight to the hospital. Let's just not muck around. It could be something we don't know. Um, and the only reason why it came out so quick in the media is because that next morning I, I was meant to be in Sydney. Um, and obviously I couldn't be there. I was in hospital um, and it ended up being a, an infection in my kidney. It just happens. Um, and again, I was out of my hands. I was in no state to be getting up at five in the morning and being on planes and, and cameras in my face and, and whatnot. So... Again, you know, it's just where how boxing is. Yeah, and, and they were quick to throw you under the bus, man. And even your last press in uh, in Sydney, main event, Ben Damon. I'm not saying anything against Ben, but he's like, it was a mission to get you. We nearly didn't have you. Now, if I don't know you yeah. better, you came from Melbourne to Sydney. It was you came at last second. They knew you were on your way. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, you know. And they did everything they can. Every every, And I said to Ben, ben Damon, you know, I said, um, without me, you don't have work. You know, and he, he just smiled and he knew I was right because, you know, Australian boxing, people find fighters and they get behind them and they show their support, which is great. But again, boxing is like Microsoft and, and Sony. It's a business. Um, you know, when it's time to fight, we fight. But 
this is how you make money. This is how you get a name. This is how you put the sport back on the map. And, um, you know, this, this is what I get paid to do. And, and people don't see what they tell me off camera. You know, you got to fire up. you got to say this. you got to say that. And, you know, at our last press conference, they, they cut it. They pulled Tim out and said, Tim, you know, you got to fire up. You, you know, you're showing too much respect. And, you know, so they were yelling at Tim. So there's a lot, a lot of things that people don't see when the off button goes on the cameras, you know what I mean? And, and this is what people need to understand. Um, I fight, win, lose, or draw, I was going to get paid the same outcome. So it didn't matter to me. Who turns away $300,000, um, you know, chased the fight for three years, invested my own time, my own money, um, for then all that time for a week out, pull out. It just, you know, people, it just doesn't make sense. Even when I try to explain it, it doesn't make sense because there was more to the story. Yeah, look, 100%, man. And again, I'm an independent reporter. I go to work, I come back, I've released videos, I record videos. I do it because I feel that you guys need to actually get your voice out there. And I feel that these people, yeah, yeah. these platforms, they push agendas. Like, I'm asking questions here. I'm not hating on Tim. I respect him. I think he's like a Triple G. He's like a Khabib. He's like a Costa. They're respectable people, limited words. They don't, you know, that's how they're made. Then you got other people who are businessmen, cash cows, who put in money to get money. And if you don't make them money, they don't really care about you. You could only ask the AFL and you can look at the NRL and his track record, Matt Damon, uh, um, uh, Matt Rose, sorry, speaks for itself. You know, and yeah, I, exactly. Yeah, you know, I didn't want you to get into any trouble with this because you know you potentially could be fighting with no limit. However, I feel the Rose Brothers are absolute bloody. I don't want to go go out and say any more, but I just feel that they're killing boxing in this country. They feel like they're saving boxing. And bro, the show they put on yesterday. Listen, the undercut was great. The fighters were great. There was no gate. I don't know what they poor yeah. what they did with poor Tim Zoo. I don't know what entrance that was. The poor black they had him dancing. I don't know what he was doing. That's what I mean. And and, and Zarafa is the reason why you know they, the stadiums fill out because people want to see me lose and people want to see because I generate the the publicity and the interest in the sport. You know, but people just think it's arrogance and it's not. You know, I don't go out there and and, and be rude and 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 you know be disrespectful in any way. I go out there and just be a little bit, you know, flamboyant and, and, and try to turn up a little bit, put a little bit of interest in the fight because in Australia, you know, everyone's got the personality of Timmy. And I take nothing away from Timmy. You know what I mean? He, he's he's a fighter. I'm a fighter. You know what I mean? And the way you bring the entertainment is by being loud. And that's just what I've, I've learned. You know, I've, I've been that quiet, God bless, and this and that gets you nowhere. You know, people just you know, get, pat you on the back and just say, oh, yeah, all the best, you know what I mean? But when you're loud, you know, you got everyone around the world tuning in. Everyone knows who Michael Zarafa is now. Yeah, no, 100%, man. So so tell us, what uh, defensive mechanisms do you have in place? I know your team, your family, you're actually a very God-conscious individual who actually is, you don't need people telling you you're that, you already know it. But how does it feel when you have people from inside the boxing world, outside the boxing world, having a dig at you? Oh, look, you know, it, it is, it, it, you feel like shit. I'm not going to sugarcoat it, um, but it doesn't matter. You know, I know, like you said, who I am, what I bring. Um, the people close to me, around me know who I am and what I bring. And that, that's all that matters. You know, in 10 years from now, 15 years from now, you know, I'm going to be retired and I'm not going to have any, I'm not going to have anything to do with these people. You know what I mean? This is a window of opportunity. It only lasts for a very short time. It's a short career. So you've got to get in there, make noise, make money. And, um, and and get on with your life. But, you know, it is disheartening when you read some of the things because it's, it's untrue. You know, if I was reading things that were, were, were true, then I'd be like, you know, well, I'll cop it on the chin. I'm, I'm, you know, a man of my word, you know what I mean? But I'm reading false, um, you know, messages and they're hearing false things. And, you know, I can't reply to every single body with the, with the, the truth. But, again, once someone has made that um, opinion about you, no matter what you do, um, you know, I could go now and, and feed Africa for the next six months. Um, they'll still think the same. And um, as long as my side of the story is out there and, and people realise that, you know, I've been in there, I've done it, you know what I mean? Why would I, Why is this fight any different? You know I mean? You can bounce back from a loss. When there's a draw, it was the same outcome for me. Um, but we're not going to go there and be rabbits and, and be, you know, treated like dogs for them to get a fight. You know, I mean, we had um, contracts in place, we had negotiations in place, and A, B, and C wasn't delivered. 
uh, and they left it to the week of the fight to tell us that they couldn't do it. Man, there, yeah, look, I'll, I'll share with you a story from the, the grandson of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. And basically, the moral of the story is God consciousness, right? If you're doing something for people, you're going to be disappointed. You ain't ever going to be satisfied. 100%. However, and, if and you're and God, you find out who your real people are. You, know, you find out who your real people are when, things, when you go through your tough times like now, you know, um, you find out who the real people are. You know, people that, uh, and sometimes I read the comments, you know, like I don't reply to them, but I read them because I'm like, hey, and this is the same guy that, you know, two weeks ago I was holding pads for or, you know, signing a pair of gloves for or giving a T-shirt away, you know, and it, it, that's what that's what sucks the most um, because, you know, inside you, you you just feel, you know, used and um, that that's the most painful thing. But besides that, like I said, I just... I just smile and wave and, and that's all you can do, man. And just be be yourself. You know, it's better better to be loved for you know who you are than hated for who you're not, you know what I'm saying? So I just enjoy it. Hundred percent, man. And back on what I was saying about God consciousness and doing it purely for God, there was once a story of a man was swearing and allegating something towards the grandson of the holy prophet. He told him, Well, if what you're saying is right about me, then may God forgive me. And if what's what if you're saying wrong, well then may God forgive you. A moral of that story is He's not defined by what that person feels about him because he knows before God, he's doing everything right. He can go to sleep, his conscience is clear because he knows he's done the right thing. If you're looking to seek exactly. people, if you're looking to seek people's pleasure, you're never going to be satisfied, bro. Go, go look at how fake social media is. Go look at the roller coaster. One minute they love you, next minute they hate you. They want to take a photo with you, and the next minute, they, you know what I mean, bro. Before I started yeah, this yeah. podcast, I go, I'm going to do a. Po- I've been saying it since I was in school. Everyone's like, yeah, started doing it. Everyone was hating. Who's going to watch it? You're going to get two, three people. Nobody cares. I'm like, you know, I'm happy. You know, I'm not going to listen to you. It took me like three, four years. I'm like, I'm doing it, even if no one watches me. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's what I mean. Like when you're, when you're, uh, you're too nice to somebody, you're fake. And if you're honest, you're rude. So no matter what you do in life, um, you can't please anybody and everybody. And, I, and I've learned that at a, at a very young age. And, as your vision and no matter what you do, as your vision gets bigger and you become more successful, your circle gets a lot smaller. Um, and the real real people stand out and the right people stand out. And it's just a shame because, you know, you let a lot of people in to find out that it was all for nothing. And yeah. um, that's the biggest thing. That's the biggest thing that hurts for me. And as I'm getting older now, I'm getting a lot more pure. And, and um, you know, from a boy, I'm a man now. And it's it's... It's just disheartening. That's all it is. You know, it's it's hurtful. 100%, man. Look, it's a shit go. But ultimately, knowing that God's there, God's just, and, you know, you're doing everything God's way, you know, you don't really need the people. And even if you look at LeBron James in his academy, because he's got an agency, right? One of the uh, rules he's got is there's no new people. Whoever you knew is what you know. All these yes people that are coming in, they're not allowing you in the inner circle because they're going to take you for a ride. Exactly. Yeah, exactly right, yeah, nice. and that's, that's the shit thing about life, man. Sometimes life, you know, brings great things, uh, but it also brings a lot of shit things too. And um, for me, like I said, as long as I get up in the morning and you make yourself happy, that's the key. You know, if you're getting up every morning to make somebody else's day better, then you're not living. And, you know, again, I've learned that at a very young age, man. 100%, and like man. out of all these haters, you know, that have written all these negativity and this and that and, and have been drilling me, you know, out of all the haters, I've never met one. <laughs> And that's the funny thing. You know I mean? I, I've never met one of them. Um, that's why I read the comments because sometimes I'm like, oh, yeah, I know this person. So, like, next time they come and talk to me, oh, I'm going to pull them up and say, hey, man, look, you know, I appreciate it. Or, you know, give them, give them no time and then make them feel, you know, this big. Yeah, yeah, no, look, it's crazy, bro. It's crazy what people can do, especially because I can't keep that same energy in person. Bro, <laughs> oh. you, you can have one hand tied behind your back and you'll be sweet. Yeah, it's funny because some say, "Oh, you know, I'm gonna knock you out. You better do this. You better do that." It's like, mate, you know where I am. You know where I train. I'm everywhere on TV and on the media. So you know where I'm at. So, mate, come down. You know what I mean? Sure, come down. But you know, that's that's the that's the sad thing is because they hide behind the computer. Um, and like I said, whether you love or you hate, you're gonna watch me. And I don't do this to cause drama and to cause chaos and upset people. I do it because this is you know how I live and how I eat and how I pay bills. And, you know, these haters aren't going to pay my bills for me. And, uh, you know, this is this is fight game. You know, you gotta, there's got to be one winner, one loser, and there's got to be one loved and one hated. And, you know, that hated one.
Bro, that, that's life, man. Look, we're we're all in de- we're not we're dependent. You know what I mean? We're not independent beings. We're thankful for our health. You got so much more to be thankful for than worrying about these idiots. You know, your health, course, your family, your loved ones. Screw this thing. It's it's, it's a facade, bro. They like you yeah, this week, the next week, bro. Go look at Floyd. <laughs> Floyd's got it. That's what I mean. I, I... I go out and win a world title, I guarantee you all those guys will, will be saying, oh, man, you're the man, champion, you know, give me some merchandise and sign gloves. And But, again, you know, this is the sport and it's run poorly in Australia. And I know because I've been all around the world, you know, and, and been with the biggest organisations, you know, top rank and, you know, DeBella and Ed Hearn, Matchroom. And you know, I've worked alongside these guys and um, it's definitely different over there than what it is here, man. Yeah, bro, no, look, 100%. But the point I was making with Floyd Mayweather, he's done everything. He's got all the money. He's got all the strip clubs. He's got all the women. Bro, he's still not happy. You know, and he, he talks about his mental health and how he's still seeking that, you know, that balance and that acceptance and moving on. He keeps himself busy because it's it's tough. The people move on, no matter who you are. So, of course, you know, this is a lifestyle. I've been doing this my whole life since I was seven years old. So, I, you know, I know that there's going to come a point in time where, I have to hang my gloves up, you know, my body and mind. My mind's still 18 years old, but my body's nearly 30, you know what I mean? And um, it's only going to get worse, you know what I mean? The mind doesn't change, you know, you still think you're untouchable and no one can beat you, but you've got these hungry up-and-comers, these young kids um, that, you know, want it and, and you're their idol and, you know, they, they push to try to be better than you. And there comes a point in time where you've got to hang them up and that's what I mean, you want to hang them up and have something to, you know, I want to stand at the front of my house and say, you know what, I fought for this. I got a fully paid off house. My family's, you know, looked after. Um, you know, financially, I, I, I'm secure. Uh, physically, mentally, I'm still switched on. You know, I mean, that's that's what people don't understand. People are quick to judge, but you know, these are the people that are getting up, that hate their lives, working for somebody that had the same drive I've got. Um, and you know, they, they're just disappointed on their own lives, so they make themselves feel better by putting me down or whoever's successful. Uh, and that's what I mean. These haters, if they knew better, they'd be doing better. So I, I generally feel sorry for them. Yeah, look, hundred percent, man. They're not they're not doing anything in their life. So, Mike, let's talk about someone who's doing something. Let's look forward. Your team's meeting tomorrow. What are we thinking? What are we doing? When are we getting in there? Look, man, I'm, I'll definitely be very, very soon. As I'm ready to go, I'm coming up a 12-week camp for Tim Zoo. I'm, I'm hungry. Uh, I'm like a shark on blood. And you know, I want to I wanna fight. And I'm hoping it's, it's very, very soon. Uh, I don't know what's planned. Uh, my team have been working super hard behind the scenes. And, uh, you know, they're the best in, in, in Australia, man. And, I think big things are coming. So stay tuned because uh, I haven't gone anywhere. Oh, look, no one's saying you went anywhere, mate. I've got another question for you. You you land the shot Stevie Spark landed. You were in there yesterday. What happens? Mate, I saw the fight and, well, I saw parts of the fight. I didn't actually watch it. But uh, if that team do, if I had rocked up yesterday, uh, not ego talking, he was exposed big time. Uh, and now I'm more confident that, you know, I, can, I will knock him out. He did a lot of bad things. Um, you know, he's very, very chin in the air. His defense is, is poor. Um, and, you know, this is a guy that's 63 kilos, um, you know, taking a fight on a week's notice. You know, I'm a different dude, and he knows that. And that's why I know that his team don't want this fight. You know what I mean? If I was so easy and beatable, well, why aren't you fighting me? You know what I mean? Why are you getting everything in the world to, to, to go against me? Why can't you just be like everybody else, neutral? When you fought Horn, you, re, you, you rescheduled for three months. Why can't you do it for me? Yeah, look, Mike, you know boxing's a small world, right? Let me tell you something. Tim Zhu had orders. He had to get rid of Stevie Spark in devastating fashion in under three rounds. He went in there fighting like that because other people were telling him how he's meant to fight and they've never fought in their lives. Well, he was getting caught with overhands. He was getting caught with stupid jabs he was getting caught with all sorts of things man you can't be doing that thing with me you know what i mean you're th- you, you come in there like that with me you're going you're going to sleep in, in four rounds I, I i'm promising you you know i don't hit like a 63 kilo fighter i'm 80 kilos you know what i mean i'm for that i'm a natural middleweight i fought at 76 i'm i'm the bigger dude i'm the more experienced the more power you know my knockout rates more than he's even fought Look, you know i mean and, and and i've taken the best in the world the distance you know what I mean? And beaten, you know what I mean? Guys that have beaten Pacquiao, Jeff Horn. I knocked him out as well. You know what I mean? People forget, I'm the first one to ever do it in Australia. Yeah, no, 100%, man. And look, something that I want you to remember, your team looked after you and made sure that contractually, you weren't hard done by. 
his team yesterday told him you're going to have to get into a fight and do one, two, three within this limit. Now, you know fighting. You can't muck around in fighting, mate. It's a game of inches. One punch changes everything. How can a team do that? Man. That's what I mean. And my team stuck by me, so I stuck by my team. And, you know, not only that, there was huge money on the table, huge opportunity. Um, you know, or, or if, you, if you go through the list of all the things that were positive, why would I pull out of the fight? There's a lot more positive than there is negative. So why would I pull out of the fight? The reason why we put out the fight is because we were promised A, B, and C and delivered none. They didn't want to postpone it. We never pulled out of a fight. We just said, look, mate, if you can't deliver this seven days out, do you want to postpone it? Within two hours, I was replaced. That replaced? He was at the gym. He had no idea of what was going on. He thought that it was a give and take. He was waiting for a response. They gave a- and people know, people, people know that I wasn't lying because that, that day I, I did a live video and I was at the gym sparring. Look, man, styles make fights, and Michael Zarafa is a very, very scary style because if Tim came in anywhere like he did yesterday and his, his promoters told him how to fight rather than his corner, and he went out after you like that, he would have been in a lot of trouble. Mate, big trouble. And, um, again, it's just made me more confident now, more hungry. And um, I want that fight. And I told you, if he doesn't, I'll be the one if he fights. If he goes overseas, he's going to lose. Um, I'm going to be the first person in Australia to take his O. I guarantee it. And he knows that. Michael Zaref, mate, you've always, you've always never shrined away from a call. So you've told him. Never. Never. That's the thing, too. Three years. I was I invested three years of, of rocking up to his fights, you know, putting myself out there, calling him out, money invested, tr- training invested, you know, blood, sweat and tears to finally get the opportunity and then one week out, pull out. It, like, it just doesn't make sense. You know what I mean? And this is what people need to understand. Mate, look, we're going forward now. Onwards and upwards, Mike. You and your team, you know what you're doing. Get in there. Get in there safe. You know, get the job done. Michael's Zarefa, what's the last message for anyone watching? Uh, look, you know, everyone that shows their love and support, um, it means so much. And, um, you know, without you guys, it isn't possible. And, um, you know, I know, I know who you guys are. And um, we're, we're moving forward, bigger and better things. And I'll be back in the ring. And for all the haters, keep hating uh, because, you know, it's only going to get worse. Hey, Michael Zarafa, mate. He's a true gentleman of Australian boxing. No matter what you guys think or say of him, I know who he is. Michael, it was a pleasure having you on the podcast, my brother. Legend, brother. Thank you so much for the support. Nah, legend, bro.